Author's Note Who are the Navajos? Before speaking about this novel, I need to say a few words about the history and present circumstances of the Navajos, those who call themselves Dine, a word meaning the people. Ethnologists tell us that the, des the distant ancestors of the Navajos came into the Southwest 1,000 or more years ago. That may be so, for their language links them with the Athabascan people of Alaska. The Navajos themselves say that they emerged into this world from a hole in the earth, and that this world is only one of a number they have lived on until catastrophic events forced them to leave. The place where they arrived is an area bounded by four sacred mountains, now known as the Four Corners area, where the present-day states of New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah come together. It is seen by them as a giant house or hogan. The sky is its roof, the earth is its floor, and those mountains are the house poles. That image alone should be enough to make anyone realize how deeply spiritual and poetic Navajo traditions are. Those traditions appear to be related to those of the Pueblo nations of the Southwest. They include incredibly beautiful chants used in healing ceremonies in which they appeal to the sacred spirits, their holy people. Translations into English of some of those chants or ways are today some of the best known examples of American Indian oral tradition. Beauty above me I walk, beauty below me I walk, beauty behind me I walk, beauty before me I walk, beauty all around me I walk. In beauty all is restored, in beauty all is made whole. Some historians have characterized the Navajos as warlike raiders preying on the other tribes in their region. I do not believe this is accurate, especially when one considers the importance of balance and peace in the sacred ways of the Diné. The arrival of the Spanish appears to have deeply upset the balance within and between the native nations of the Southwest. The Spanish also introduced widespread slavery. Throughout the Mexican Southwest, that later became New Mexico, countless thousands of American Indians were captured and forced to work in the mines or as personal slaves. Virtually every Spanish household had its complement of Indian slaves. Navajo resistance to the slave trade was described as raiding by the Spanish. When the United States gained control of the Southwest, the Navajos thought at first they'd been liberated. Unfortunately, the Americans listened not to the Indians, but to the New Mexicans, who wished to continue the slave trade and convince the United States to engage in warfare against the Navajos. A brutal campaign was then waged under the leadership of Kit Carson. It resulted in the total defeat of the Navajos, the destruction of their homes, fields, and orchards, and their forced exile for several years to a bleak outpost in eastern New Mexico, far from Deneta. The Navajo Long Walk, which ended that campaign, was as awful an experience for the Navajos as the Trail of Tears was for the Cherokee. It was a forced march of almost the entire Navajo Nation. More than 10,000 people trudged 400 miles across mountains and deserts to a desolate army post. So many died along the way that modern Navajos still speak of it as if it was just yesterday. By the late 1860s, some thought that the Navajos were not only a defeated people, but a people on their way to extinction. Yet the Navajos never gave up. After years of bitter exile, they were allowed to return to their homeland only after pledging never again to take arms against the United States. Their warrior tradition was supposed to be ended forever. The recovery of the Navajo Nation that took place over the next century and a half is so incredible that one might conclude that not only are the Navajos one of the most remarkable native nations that has ever existed, but also 
that they have truly been blessed and protected by their holy people. Today, the Navajo Reservation comprises 26,897 square miles. It is the largest Indian reservation in the United States. There are more than 200,000 Navajos. Although it is not without its problems and challenges, the Navajo Nation has been described as one of the most economically prosperous and forward-looking of all the American Indian nations in the United States. Yet, it is also true that a deep regard remains for the ancient traditions of Deneta. The Code Talkers I've long been fascinated by the story of the Navajo Code Talkers and the role they played in World War II. In that part of the conflict, that was fought against Japan in the Pacific Ocean, Navajo Marines used their native language to create an unbreakable code. Because they were Marines, that arm of the U.S. military that leads all others into the thick of battle, they also saw some of the heaviest fighting of the war. If any American servicemen deserved to be honored, it was those Navajos. But for decades, there were no parades, no public honors, no official recognitions of the crucial role they played. From the end of the war in 1945 until 1969, the very existence of a Navajo code and the intelligent and courageous work of those several hundred Navajo Mar Indian Marines remained top secret. I was born in 1942. Like many others of my generation, World War II is a part of my own family's history. Several of my relatives saw intense action in that war, including my Aunt Margaret, whose early death was a result of a disease contracted while she was an army nurse in the Philippines. My Uncle Jimmy James Smith, Jr. was himself a Marine in the 3rd Division, 3rd Tank Battalion, Company B. He took part in such campaigns as Bougainville and Okinawa, two places where code talkers played a vital role. The conversations I've had with Uncle Jim about his experiences in the war and the information he shared with me helped me understand what it was like on those grim and distant islands when the Marine Corps was the first to land. Uncle Jim even loaned me such rare volumes as the 3rd Marine Division and Captain Bryan's Pacific War Atlas. My uncle remembered the presence of those Navajo Marines. However, his impression, like that of most other Marines, was that the Navajos were being used as scouts. I always figured those Indians had some important job, Uncle Jim said, but it was kept secret from us. He never knew their real story until more than three decades after the end of the war. Today, despite a number of books and a major Hollywood movie starring Nicolas Cage as a shell-shocked non-Indian Marine, whose personal story takes center stage, the true story of the Code Talkers still remains relatively unknown. Because of the top secret nature of their code, none of the major books written about World War II before 1969 contain any mention of them. To this day, it's still easy for both historians and the general public to talk and write about the Pacific Campaign without feeling the necessity to mention the Navajo Code Talkers. That lack of understanding and appreciation is one of the reasons I ended up telling this story. However, I must confess that I never intended to write this book. Somehow, over the last decade, the project took on a life of its own and swept me along with it. Two things led to my taking on this project. The first was my interest in the American Indian languages. My own tribal heritage is Western Abenaki. My family has been deeply involved in trying to preserve and teach this language, which now has a base of less than 40 fluent speakers. It is almost as bad for most of the more than 300 indigenous languages that were spoken before Columbus in what is now the United States. The loss of our languages was accelerated by the development in the late 19th century of government boarding schools. 
Virtually all American Indian children were forced into these schools, much like the one my protagonist in this novel attends. In those schools, everything that was Indian was forbidden. Lieutenant Richard Pratt's Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania was the model. Pratt's model was to kill the Indian and save the man. Indian language was a weed to be pulled up by its roots and thrown on the trash heap. Yet half a century later, boarding school educated Indians, who'd been told their language and culture were of no use to the modern world, were recruited by the United States and asked to use that language they'd been ordered to forget in the defense of their country. It is one of the greatest ironies of American history that American Indian languages have been of that sort of use to the very nation that forbade them. During World War I, such languages as Cherokee and Choctaw were employed by American Indian soldiers in the trenches to radio messages the Germans couldn't understand. In the European theater of war during World War II, Comanche Indian soldiers used their language to send similar messages. However, only the Navajo language was used to create a true code, which the Marines used just not in World War II, but also during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Because of my interest in language preservation, those stories of native tongues being used by the military really stuck with me. In some ways, this novel can be read as a parable about the importance of respecting other languages and cultures. It's even more ironic that Navajos were the Indians chosen by the Marines. Many of those men had grandparents who were survivors of the U.S. Army campaign that was fought to destroy the Navajos in the 1860s and the nightmarish long walk that concluded it. This brings me to the second thing that led to my taking on this project. In 1996, I was commissioned by the National Geographic Society to research and write a book about the survival of two remarkable Indian American Indian nations. Those nations were the Cherokee and the Navajos. And the eventual book, Trail of Tears, Path to Beauty, was published in 2000. As I traveled the route of the Navajo Long Walk and spoke with many different Navajo people, I began to think again about the Code Talker story. Some of the Navajo people I met were Code Talkers, but it seemed that every Navajo had some connection in one way or another to those brave men. The wartime experience of the Code Talkers and what they did when they returned to the United States turned out to be a major force in shaping the destiny of their people. Code Talkers took the lessons they had learned while serving in the military and put them into the service of their people and their culture. Seeing all they did as teachers, as businessmen, as artists, as major tribal leaders made me respect them even more. My first book for the National Geographic Society led to a second one, a picture book entitled Navajo Long Walk that I did with my friend Shanto Begay, a Navajo artist whose pictures told the story even more powerfully than my words. So I suggested the idea of another picture book, this time one about the Code Talkers. When National Geographic Books declined the idea, I took it to another of my publishers, Lee and Low Books. My good friend, Philip Lee, liked the idea. With his editorial input, I worked through six different drafts. Finally, after more than a year of work, Philip decided it just wasn't working. This story is too big for a picture book he told me. I knew he was right. My next step was to rethink it as a novel and propose it to one of my favorite editors, Lori Hornick at Dial. She accepted my proposal enthusiastically, even though I know her enthusiasm was dampened, if not drowned, by the first draft of the book I sent to her. After years of research, reading hundreds of books and countless articles, watching documentary films, visiting museums and libraries, speaking with many people, including surviving code talkers, there was an immense amount of history 
that I felt needed to be told. As a result, that first full draft was so heavy with facts, names, dates, places, that you could have used it as an anchor. Don't worry, I said. The character will come out as I revise it. There will be less, a little less history and a lot more of his story. There's still a lot of history in this story, and I've done my best to keep it accurate. Even though my main character and narrator is fictitious, I haven't invented events. Everything that happens to Ned Begay happened to real Navajo people, including the boarding school episodes at the start of the tale. With the exception of some of the white Marines, such as his buddies, Smitty and Georgia Boy, the characters named in this novel are all real people. Their stories have been well documented elsewhere. Whatever I have done, however, this is not my story. It belongs to the Navajo people. Anything that is good in it must be credited to them. I thank them for it. And although I've tried to do my best, I know that I am only a human being and that I may have made mistakes. For that, I am truly sorry. However, I believe that the beauty and power of the Navajo Way is so great that it will shine through whatever clouds of confusion my own failings may have created. The lessons my Navajo friends have shared with me over the years are truly the only reason I was able to attempt this inspiring, important story, a tale that is as much about the beauty of peace and understanding as it is about the pain and confusion of war.